When it comes to web app and API security, the choice is simple. You can choose Fastly's security solution that teams will actually use in full blocking mode, just like 90% of their customers. Or you can stick with costly options that you probably just turn off. You can get Fastly's all-in-one platform that protects apps everywhere they live, however they're built. Or departments can agree to disagree. You can go to securityweekly.com forward slash Fastly to learn more. Or you can just wish you had. With the skills gap increasing, it's more important than ever to train your staff effectively and efficiently. Offensive Security provides training for your organization designed by the same minds behind Kali Linux. Here are two recent offerings from Offsec. Offsec Academy gives you the chance to earn industry-leading OSCP certification with dedicated one-on-one -on -one mentoring. You can also try Proving Grounds Enterprise, created exclusively by Offensive Security's InfoSec experts for highly realistic simulated networks. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Offsec to learn more. If you welcome back to Paul's Security Weekly. Sorry, it's, it's like still really hot in the studio, <laughs> and my brain is melting. Uh, but we are uh, doing the news, and if you want to stay in the loop, all things Security Weekly, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. Subscribe on your favorite podcast catcher. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, our mailing list. Sign up for that, and join our Discord server. Also, if you missed Security Weekly Unlocked, fabulous uh, conference with great presentations, you can access all the content on demand. If you registered or not, you can go to securityweekly.com forward slash unlocked and check out all of that content. So, kind of missing that old uh, hack naked news are. about now, aren't you? Aren't you, Paul? The, the what now? Hack naked news. Hack naked news. Yes, that's what we used to call the, the news show. Yeah. I'm yeah. just really it's tripping out. One of my monitors is like totally like, like backwards. Weird backwards. It's just <laughs> like I'm in, I'm in charge on that monitor. What was in that beer? Was it, is it the heat or did someone spike my drink? <laughs> I don't know. Vietnamese <laughs> could be uh, the It was beer. the Fosters. And, uh, what the you Fosters. don't know, Paul, is it's not backwards. It's actually upside down. It's, it's just they're like they're driving Australia on the is. correct side of the road. What so, side of the road do they drive on in Australia? Is it the left side or the right side? Uh, the right in side. Australia, we drive on the left. You drive uh, on the left. Which is the right side. In Australia, that's the right, the correct no. side of the road. The right no, side is the left. Correct. To correct. climb the Twin it's Peaks of Kilimanjaro. Oh, it's way too hot in here to be talking like that. <laughs> Stop <laughs> it right now. Hey, Paul, I got a question for you. Yes. Uh, and this is the preempt, but uh, are you going to let me, um, you know, do a small Please do. Yeah. advertisement Let's for do my it. thing? You're teaching a class? Yeah. What are you yeah, doing, do Joff? Right Look at it's Joff and evil Joff. <laughs> so in one, in one moment, like, and you're pointing in both and, directions know, at and, once. And I am. I'm pointing ah, in two directions at once. It's, it's quantum Joff. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> oh. uh -huh. His uh, evil so, twin so is on the left monitor. Now, His then. good, the good Joff is on the right side. Oh boy. Yeah, we're there we're is. we're in trouble here. We're in trouble. Yeah. There there is no good Joff. Um, well, it's so evil I, and eviler. I guess, I guess that's a yes. You want me to do that now? Do it, Joff. Do it. Do it. Do, uh, it. do it. I uh, dare you. Do it. Okay, so uh, look, right I'm going to take my few minutes for a quick, shameless plug. Whip it out. Uh, so, so this uh, this May, uh, I am uh, putting on another virtual session of my enterprise attacker emulation and C2 implant development class. If you are interested, you can uh, go to Take URL bit.ly slash joffs, that's J-O-F-F-S, C2 class, and you can sign up. We have that in the show notes, I believe. And if you want to know what it's all about, well, what it is is I talk about various different ways to develop custom malware uh, in, the of de uh, in the context of delivering uh, C2 channels. I also talk about a custom C2 channel. Uh, we will cover uh, Python. We'll cover some C Sharp. We will cover some Golang. We will talk about all kinds of shellcode execution and delivery in those various mechanisms, uh, some process injection mechanisms. Uh, we will talk about all kinds of interesting ways to uh, live off the land as well, some threat modeling, attacker emulation, all kinds of good stuff. So if you're interested in the class, uh, you can go visit the URL, and that is the registration URL, bit.ly slash joffs c2 class. And the next session is May the 4th through – May the 4th, right? May the 4th be with you through May the 7th. Uh, we're teaching four hours at a time. It's a 16-hour class. It's very affordable. I think we're coming out at $495. 
uh, for a student. And furthermore, we do do uh, donate a portion of the proceeds to underrepresented people in information security. And right now that is female groups in information security. Our focus is various. We have uh, different uh, charities on the list, uh, anything from WESIS, uh, for example, um, to other uh, female empowerment groups and training uh, girls and women to get into information security. So there it is. Uh, did I miss anything? Questions? Concerns? So, Josh, that's uh, an awful lot of content for 16 hours. I mean, as, you know, you're going to you provide headbands to keep our heads from exploding? Yeah, I, I, I try to do that. Um, no, so the other thing I do, there is a lot of content for 16 hours. It's, it's, it's fun-filled. It is content-packed for sure. There is a custom GitHub repo that goes along with the class. You get a whole bunch of source code. Uh, to go along with all of the teaching, uh, as well as the slides in electronic format. And so you have a lot to go back to and reference after the class. And I even maintain the uh, deployment keys for the GitHub repo uh, up to, uh, I think what last time we did it was six months uh, after the end of the class and uh, any sort of minor typos and updates will uh, go back into the repo. So. Good value there, um, and it's uh, yeah, it's a tremendous amount of material. But uh, the last class, I got really good reports. People got a lot out of it, uh, and people definitely did enjoy it. A lot of this, frankly, is driven around techniques for evading endpoint uh, detection and defenses. Uh, it basically, custom techniques uh, that you need to uh, learn as a advanced pen tester and red teamer uh, to mm -hmm. to be more effective. So. So does that mean you're going to create an applications class as a part two? Uh, so not likely an applications class, although I am considering uh, writing a C-sharp uh, class from an offensive uh, perspective. So there might be something Ooh. there uh, coming down the pike. Uh, and also, while you give me the opportunity, uh, Lee, um, we don't have a date for it yet, but I am going to teach a four-hour session on regular expressions as a lifestyle. Uh, Holy in the shit. Year. Wow, probably... that's a pretty shitty lifestyle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere wow. probably you, you... later in May, you will see a regular expressions as a lifestyle session. <laughs> does that, uh, does that come with hey, like hey, a, a I'll bourbon give you a and a joint? Expression. It better. <laughs> it better. <laughs> you guys have yeah. got to see Joff teaching regular expression. He gets at least a foot taller. He <laughs> loves it. I mean, it, it makes sense, man. When you the magic mushrooms that come with the course, <laughs> like, wow, man, wow, man, the regular expressions, oh. awesome. I, think I even understood him after he taught me. It's a teaser on that. Did anybody actually know that the born again shell bash does regular expressions? Yes, in of the course, shell everybody knows that. Yeah, of course, uh, they really yeah. right. So there's lots of cool stuff, right? And there's well, yeah, because like you can use like the the carrot to run a command yep. that contain the, or substitute with regular expressions, and the the carrot is you can. But yeah, 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 yeah. So you that can, makes sense. Or you can and, use it in conditional testing, yeah. right? You can. Uh, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. You or can. did anybody actually know that the grep command not only does extended regular expressions, but is able to do Perl compatible regular expressions as well? Is that egrep? E is the yeah, right. e right. it's, not, it's not the dash E flag. If you put a dash capital P flag on grep. I'm starting to e grep one. letting Joff t do this whole bit. Yeah. <laughs> you can do compatible regular expressions with grep. It's super cool. In fact, I even have an example in the regular expressions as a lifestyle uh, lecture sequence that talks about using a combination of curl and grep to fetch a web page and extract all of the URLs directly out of that web page and and write them to a file or whatever you want to do with them. I mean, or or um, you could just use Python and Beautiful Soup and actually understand your code. Yeah, you could do that <laughs> if you really wanted to. So thanks for uh, taking the air out of my freaking uh, Anyway. <laughs> all right. Back to the regular programming. <laughs> regular programming, not regular expressions. Uh, Jeff, I... I <laughs> Caught one of your story number five. Salt stack revises a partial patch for command injection and privilege escalation. So the second fix 
reportedly necessary after they didn't participate in coordinated disclosure. Well, what's going on here? <laughs> well, I saw that, and I I happened to read in Mayhul's uh, uh, bio on on, mm. on our website that he used to work at Salt Stack. So I mostly put the story up. Because uh, were they? I, yeah, I mean, I mean, I yeah, they were yeah. for my time. G- a great open would, source project, and yeah. they built a commercial offering on it um, for uh, configuration management and then the extended to patch uh, management. Mayho was working there, trying to to bring their product to the next level with his knowledge that he he brought from Tenable. Then they had like a ma- uh, in. Uh, I don't have any official statements from Mayho or right. SaltStack. Um, but they did have a, a pretty heinous remote code execution vulnerability, uh, and, and then you know I don't I don't know how that impacted them. Basically, I, I never really I, I mean I tested out some salt stack stuff, but I never deployed it in production. Uh, and this sounds like Jeff, it's new vulnerabilities uh, as well. New vulnerabilities, and you know, just based on a a, a quick skimming of the article, uh, whoever the developer was that was working on the first fix. Uh, you know, didn't didn't have it QA, didn't have it checked, and and just kind of put it out there. They, did, you know, they didn't follow what would you you would assume would be some sort of uh, process for for promoting a a patch. Is, is this so the they, bug that so is this a bug again? Is this the bug that lets you push instructions outside the container? Uh Salsac wasn't necessarily a container. They worked in all kinds of environments. Okay. Maybe I got. I, I, I think it underscores like we as security professionals and hackers know like no one's code is going to be perfect. Like no one's going to raise their hand and be like, ah, I write perfect code that contains no vulnerabilities ever, right? That largely our judgment of that is your response to it. And there's been a lot of open source projects where they they've had vulnerabilities and they're really quick to fix them. Commercial yeah. vendors, a lot of them yeah. really quick to fix yeah. them, right? I think it's all about your response. And if your response gets kind of weird with disclosure and all that stuff, we're like, uh, that's not good. I mean, this one had, the, this one was a command injection mm-hmm. law that allowed for local privilege ex- ex- right. escalation, mm-hmm. and it has a CVE number twenty twenty dash two eight two four three. That's all I'm going to say about that. I mean, that whole Dominion idea of, of pushing out exploit. Say again. Minion privilege escalation exploit. It's got a cool name. Mm. Yeah. Well, the what is it? The agent's called a minion. I think in the Salt agents Sack. are called minions in yeah. Salt Sack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I love this cool name. It makes it I great. Mean, some of this I is like. just, a, you know, I mean, that what you're talking about about we got into this idea. We'll just push beta code. You know, back even in the '90s, it was like sort of the idea was like, we'll let the users debug it. You mm-hmm. know, we'll just throw it out there and hope that you know they'll I find had that all the philosophy. Problems. Yeah. Well, that's kind of how it all started. I mean, that was. Yeah, you know, but that's that's now of, modern the starting. Web. That's how that's it, now that's modern how. starting to translate into that's fine, but you need to put fixes. Be ready to push these fixes when people start finding yeah. the bugs, because if you don't, they're going to get exploited until everybody gets sued blue. Mm-hmm. Craziness. Yeah. Well, they fixed it eventually. <laughs> no good. Good. So, the first second fix time, was in like, February, and the second fix was at the end of March. That's not a bad from partial to full fix interval. No. Yeah, it's all. not heinous. It's not heinously, right? We, we've seen it drag on a lot longer, certainly. I mean, I hate well, having to apply a second patch, but, you know. Something could be said for compare and contrast that to the companies that don't do anything until they get the, the fix right. And so the, the, the vulnerabilities out there in the wild for how many weeks or months <clears> or Years, years or decades. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think uh, I think the day is coming where you're going to have to have a team ready when something is found to p- at least put out mitigation instructions right then, or agreed. you're gonna you're gonna have a massive liability. It depends hands. on the you know the, the product. Well, it depends on what usage. it is too. I mean, so. what if there's an arbitrary code execution in Doom version 1.9, <laughs> which is the <laughs> ultimate Doom? <laughs> And I, I just want to be clear here. This is Doom running on DOS. Like, this is not... Of course. How, how do you run Doom? Right? It, well, I mean, there is the late. What is the latest version Is there version any other Doom? way? No, there's a latest version of Doom. I just run it on my refrigerator. It runs in... Um, <laughs> is it... Uh, it runs in Steam. I think there's the yeah, latest run, version of Doom, right? Steam. That runs there, there is a Steam version. Yeah, I mean, what is it? But what is the, late, the latest version's Doom... 
I don't know what Eternal, the number is. I don't know. I ran it. The graphics are like, it's a, it's amazing. I played it for like 15 minutes. <laughs> so, so, so Steam, Steam yeah, is Doom like 2016 the and Doom Eternal are like, like Doom has wow. had a, a long history. This yeah. particular exploit, though, goes back to the version 1.9 of Ultimate Doom that ran on DOS. Now, what's cool is you can read about all of the, you know, technical details about how they implemented the, they loaded a save game and were able to, to gain uh, code execution. But I didn't realize that there was like this whole community around hacking Doom, like oh, yeah. still creating, what do they call those? Sprites and Sprite. uh, game files. What are the game files called? They're called something. They said it in Oh, there. yeah. There's a uh, name for them. Uh, I don't remember what they're called. It's but like the, the whole level. So you, you could you write cause, levels and... Because I used to yeah. write levels for Duke Nukem. For Quake and Duke Nukem. Yeah, and so Half I wrote, all, those, work. I wrote yeah. all the Duke Nukem... Nuke, I wrote a bunch of Duke Nukem levels. But they have... There's a website, doomworld.com. They have their own awards ceremony. And like no they way. highlight the person who like created the coolest hack or the coolest world for like even these really old versions of Doom. And this dude on uh, GitHub, KGSWS, that found this exploit, credits like people in the forums that have like Ida screenshots that are like, hey, like I got this far, but like I wasn't sure what like what to do with it. Like he basically weaponized this particular vulnerability, found an exploit for it. It was like awarded an award at like the Doom Doom World. They call it the Kako Awards uh, in in 2020, and he won the Maka Award Maka Award for most creative, unusual, or artistically compelling project of the year for an arbitrary code execution in Doom version 1.9. I just thought that was really cool. It by is the cool. Way. Like there's a whole community around this, and they like recognize people that are finding security yeah. vulnerabilities and, ha and even today. hacking in the truest sense. It's awesome stuff. And trying to run Doom on weird devices like a vacuum cleaner or something. Yeah, yeah, that's it's the awesome. one game. You, like, yeah, my your refrigerator runs Doom, right? That was the thing. I used to run Doom on my four eighty six. Yeah, <laughs> isn't it just isn't it just weird that like Steam is the collection agency for mm -hmm. <laughs> ancient games? <laughs> it's kind of funny. Yeah, because they picked up Half Life and Doom and. Which gives them Counter Strike and, and all that stuff is available. Well, I, I will say if if you're interested in like a lot of times when students are talking about trying to learn how to hack things and stuff like that, and games are always interesting. Going back to a lot of those really old games and getting platforms to run them on run DOS and edit your config. Yeah, dot sys a lot to run of them. Doom. A yep. lot of those games don't have much in the way of security. Yeah. And it is a good way to sort of introduce yourself to the way a lot of modern hackers learned how to do this stuff because they were back there banging away on these games That's and right. trying things. That's what and I would do. Just like there's open redirect Sven was talking about, it's just trying stuff. You know, it's like, well, how does this work? And trying to understand it and looking at the files and are all the sprites stored in this file? Mm -hmm. Can I tweak the sprites so that all of them have like little, you know, Donald Trump heads or whatever running around? And, and there's all kinds of fun this things you can do. Implemented something in a game that was a snake. And that was like part of the level that they loaded in order to to get to that point where they could execute mm. arbitrary code. It's pretty cool. awesome, fun. That stuff that stuff is fun. So yeah, if you're out there and you're thinking about this stuff, that's the fun stuff to get involved in. It's it's a good way to train your brain to think about the way people think about these kind of problems. I think a similar exercise is if you want to load OpenBSD on your eighth gen Lenovo ThinkPad X1 Carbon. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, I, I, I'm, uh, I, hey, I'm kind of run. All right, I'm brave. <laughs> oh that I run God. Linux? I run Linux, but like I, I like I, I'm not gonna like say I'm like leet and all. Like I run a modern version of Ubuntu Ooh. on my laptops. Like that's not like a stretch as much as like <laughs> I'm gonna run OpenBSD on, on my laptop. On I mean, the article kind of goes through like. You know, like in order to make the, the to tweak the resolution, I had to make these uh, X rand. Anytime you're running X render to modify mm -hmm. your graphics subsystem, like that's you're, yeah. you're, you're hacking your system. Then it's funny. He gets to the point where it's like, yeah, Bluetooth. He's like, yeah, no, that that's not. Like, <laughs> he's like, if you want Bluetooth, like you just got to run another operating system. Like yeah. it's just not there. Like don't even this try. Is not yeah. designed for that. Yeah, or you'd have to code it yourself. I mean, or that's something. brave. I, I that's it's, hacking. I, it's awesome. I mean, again, it's the same kind of thing. I'm like, this is how a lot yeah. of people got where they are today because I get asked that question a lot. I'm like, how did you know? How did right. you get here? And right. I'm like, this is take the kind his, of stuff. take this laptop and go get. 
get yeah. OpenBSD running. That on would be it. great. Yeah. Like if you want to graduate, yeah. here, take this laptop, bring it back when you got. You can either run Gen two or you can run OpenBSD. Right. Pick one. I mean, I'll even be nice and be like, you don't have to get Bluetooth running. Like, no, I'll, I'll yeah. give you that Bluetooth one. Bluetooth extra fine. credit. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> you're running the Bluetooth stack from scratch. Like that's yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because I always tell people about when when Lou and I were trying to install Gen two on that machine, had his like weird. He had this like souped up Turtle Beach sound card, like fifty wires coming out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we couldn't get the thing to work. And I was like, why are we trying to run Gentoo on this? And he was like, I don't know. We might as well. Right. And I was like, well, okay, get the Gen. That's <laughs> that's when you get a drive and you put Windows on it. And when you want to use the sound card, you boot into Windows. That, but yeah, but we did, we did, you know, it was, it was a thing. It was yeah. like, we want so, this to work. So, so for the longest time, it, you just reminded me, for the longest time, OpenBSD didn't support uh, any form of symmetric multiprocessing processing at, right. at all. Right. In the, in the kernel, I'm talking about in the kernel. Um, because Theo just said no, <laughs> mm -hmm. just just not gonna do it. <laughs> Give it for it's not um, happening. Um, so I don't know if that's still the case because I lost touch. But I used to run major university B, uh, DNS servers on OpenBSD, and I refused to uh, to step away from it because those DNS servers solid. were rock solid. I used yeah. to run, I used to run my Snore IDS sensors on OpenBSD because it was just solid. I had friends who really swore by the security of FreeBSD. They would yeah. Yeah. take it out of their cold, dying hands. Yep. I used to run my proxy servers uh, on FreeBSD. I had an alpha that was running Sarge. Mm. Mm. But be honest, Paul, was it well, because it was BSD or because it was free? <laughs> it was it because was it was I mean, BSD. It was, it was both, though. I mean, it was both, yeah. We, but, we, I mean, wanted, mm, we didn't have much of a budget you know 20 plus years ago in security so if we could we would literally scrap old hardware like when a project that ran right. a lottery system or they would decommission the desktops from uh, the, the systems that the users uh, uh the students would use at the university so they have like 30 desktops and then they go well they need faster machines so let's replace them i'm like can i have six of those yeah. Older ones, and I'd put OpenBSD on them. And the right. same thing with like a lottery company, I'd be like, "You're decommissioning like maybe some of those on old Sun servers, or those are like still they may not like run the shit that you need for the lottery." I'm like, "They can be proxy servers for yeah. like our stuff." So like, why don't we take those and we'll run open source software? So Jeff, I mean, honestly, it was really both. Yeah, we okay. ran whatever we needed to run on whatever we had, and what yeah, we I could still so we could scrounge. Was Free was the operative, but whatever. Well, I, I mean, but OpenBSD was free too. So yeah, yeah. It's I mean, just a, they're it's all a, for, I'm, a fork. Is it a fork of? They're both. They're forks all forks of BSD. Of BSD. Yeah, so BSD. Berkeley yeah. Linux, Berkeley Unix was the original mm -hmm. source of all this stuff, and right. they're all just various forks of it. So. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Now I'm so, so, so what was the what was the other under. what was the other variation back in Net the day? BSD. Net BSD is what you think. Net BSD. I was thinking system. Was it System, system 5? five. No, no, it's System 5. System, oh. yeah. system 3? System five. There's, a whole, there's a whole tree on yeah. the internet. Yeah. You, you get, get that giant five. chart. I haven't there's committed there's it to like memory, cool I'll be quite honest, but there is a whole... Well, now you got something to do this weekend. It's hierarchy. But, I mean, I remember, you know, 20, 25, 30-some years ago, I mean, it was quite the... You know, it, it was it was like uh, politics today, you know, mm. which version yes. you, yeah. you believed in. If you, you followed the tree you, all the way to the top, you PDP 11s ran the first versions of Unix. Yep. Yeah. PDP 11. Yep. Rock and a roll. Actually, Paul, to be uh, completely accurate, that was uh, a PDP 7. Well, yes. yeah, it ran correct. that before you were right. Off. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. I agree. And then BSD 1.0 uh, branched off of that, as did uh, uh, Unix version 7. Uh, SunOS, interestingly, was, and you can tell I've looked it up. Yeah, you're seeing well, SunOS is System uh, Five. You're reading correct, off the Google. Correct. No, 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 I no, no. SunOS Sun was branched off of BSD. Derivative. Actually, it wasn't to Solaris until we got System Five. All right. Okay. Um, Solaris, uh, Solaris actually took. Uh, it, it actually inherited uh, a lot of the System Five functionality, it, and it was a massive departure from SunOS because SunOS was BSD based. Mm. Uh, if you guys remember correctly. Uh, and then out of the BSD family, now that I've got the chat in front of me, I might as well read it to you. Uh, <laughs> we have uh, FreeBSD, NetBSD, which is what I was mentioning, mm -hmm. and OpenBSD. Uh, and then out of FreeBSD also branched 
uh, Dragonfly BSD. So huh. today you actually have FreeBSD, Dragonfly, NetBSD, and OpenBSD. Uh, and on the System 5 side, you've got AIX, uh, OpenServer, Unixware, if you remember that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, Shout uh, out to Solaris. HBucks. If you say if you say begat a lot, it sounds really impressive, you know, like like yeah, free BSD begat <laughs> open AIX, which mm-hmm. begat and yeah. And, and and the little sidestep that's actually kind of interesting, which a lot of people have forgotten about, uh, is that uh, next, next step, if you remember the yeah. next mm-hmm. Oh yeah, uh, had, was it BSD the derivative? had a relationship with yeah. BSD. In fact it, it branched off of the Unit Unix version eight. Uh, a branch of BSD uh, and Unix version 9 and 10 from Bell Labs. And then Next Step came out of that, uh, which then turned into Mac OS X uh, eventually. You so wonder Mac how much, OS how X, much, but you those, wonder how those much were the that, days, and, and then Windows NT came along and spoiled everything. Well, you wonder how much a Mac well, OS still has a lot of that original yeah. BSD. A lot. Know, yeah, 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 Mac, Mac, Mac OS X has D was a, a was strong a relationship to BSD, which mm. is why I always liked it. Uh, up until maybe more recently. recently yeah. Um, and then Linux is kind of the odd child in a way uh, and successful, um, God knows why. But anyway, um, because I find Linux to be script kitty even to this day, but it, it pretty much grew out of Minix originally. Correct. Mm-hmm. Um, so. And there's the entire history lesson all wow. right here on Security <laughs> Weekly. This is not the security news. Of this Windows. is the security no. history but lesson. But interesting, in an upcoming talk that I'm going to give, uh, I'll talk about the history of hacking and hacking culture and, and how it it's relevant today. But trace back some of the roots to 1955 when the Model Railroad Club, before computers, dubbed it hacking at MIT. Hmm. And they would literally hack on model railroad uh, cars. Then they, a PDP-1 was one of the first computers that they would use for hacking for the model railroad. Also used it for phone freaking. And I actually pulled a snippet, a screenshot of an article from 1963, I want to say, that was one of the first publications to use the term hacking in its truest sense, where MIT students would use a PDP-1 to do basically like war dialing. It's pretty interesting. Some of the first hackers failed to tie their neckties in double Windsor knots, and that was how they were they were identified. As, I, that as, was as a, apparently a thing. You guys would remember that. I I I don't. <laughs> it was a vulnerability. I, I don't remember upset. that. Doug's Bad way upset. older than I am. <laughs> Well, uh, we did. Well, wow, that was a rabbit hole. We, we you were fully, born we in the fleshed out that <laughs> rabbit hole. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Guys, bring the shovels. Are we going to be able to get out of this hole? Let, I mean, let's let's go like way out of the rabbit hole. Okay. Jump to Doug. Your story. Like anyone with an iPhone can make deep fakes, right? Ooh. We go from like 1955 to the first hackers there before you go. computers. To now, anyone with an iPhone can create deep fakes. So now, my great grandfather is starring in a porn tape on my on my life. Probably in the twenties. You know, sixty, seventy years later, we end up. It's amazing how technology progressed, right? To to now, this point. I mean, this is just a routine where you can literally scan. You take the app, you you put it on your phone, and you scan any picture you want. You can scan my great, 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 great. I have a I have a painting, or not a painting. It's actually a photograph. Of my great 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 grandfather who served in the Civil it's War, a, hanging on my it's living room wall. It's a daguerreotype. It, well, I don't know. I don't think it's a daguerreotype, Jeff. I, I think it's, Je- Jeff was in that picture. Yeah, he's in the background, kind of like <laughs> yeah, standing yeah, there, yeah. going "PCI boys, <laughs> <laughs> huzzah!" But, <laughs> but I mean, you can literally scan his face out of that picture, and you can embed it and have it move, blow kisses to you. I guess so you, you, could, you take a picture of that picture with an you iPhone. You scan his yeah. face and it sucks it into the deep fake. And then you can scan backgrounds. You can scan anything. You scan your cat and put it in a deep fake. It's porn just an or, app yeah. you put on uh, yeah. iOS. Yeah. And it's like, so that kind of, that level of, of I guess it's AI enabled uh, control. Mm. Well, something's having to adjust those, fa- because the faces actually move. It's not just like a like one of those uh, jib jabs where the face is kind of hanging there in right, space. Right, right, yeah, It yeah, literally, yeah. It like... moves the face. Animates yeah. the face. The eyes move. The mouth moves. It's, like, super crazy creepy. Like, this is the thing you can terrify your children with. Mm. Like, 
Grandma so is the, watching, you know. Kind the of. technology has advanced, but it, it's not a new concept. No, I mean, I, I was, I mean, I was thinking, what, what was the first deep fake? The first thing that comes to mind, and I'm sure it's going back further. The, Do you the remember first the man movie, to walk on the moon? The, <laughs> the Jack Nicholson movie, The Shining. Yeah, where spoiler alert, where at the very end they're showing the photo of like the of the the dance hall and everybody's in their white tuxes yeah. or whatever. It's from the 30s or something. They zoom in and there's Jack Nicholson. I mean, that was a deep fake. But, you know, they, they just superimposed his face on a photograph. That was 1980. But I, I bet you it goes back to, like, the, the silent movies. Well, I mean, those, yeah, those guys did all kinds of tricks with things like that where they used rear screen projectors and things like that to, to make sort of the same kind of thing. But this is really it, sophisticated. Hitchcock, Hitchcock. Well, yeah. It's yeah, Hitchcock did it all the time. Hitchcock I mean, probably probably invented it. But, I mean, this, this lets you do it with quickly and easily. You don't need industrial light and magic to set it up and put it all together. You can do it on your iPhone you and make some, Bud, some Budweiser. I I want some Bud <laughs> Budweiser. Why is We're that class- even in the studio? We're classing it up tonight. I'm telling we you, we have like, a giant God. can of Budweiser. We're one step up from drinking PBRs, and <laughs> uh, Doug's gonna <laughs> shotgun it live oh, on the yeah, show. Actually, right, that ship this sailed. I already opened it. But a so tall boy. Coronavirus I- isolation is really a thing. It's it's causing it's, all sorts of issues. It's, <laughs> it's why really, is so there if I create Budweiser a deepfake, can I get an NFT for it? What what I really want an NFT for a deepfake, Lee? Maybe. Yeah, why not? But why is the can of Budweiser bigger than the can of Foster's? That's where I'm. It's just yeah. taller. Oh, the Foster's is fatter. It's an optical Bud- illusion, yeah. Jeff. It's a girth deep- versus length. It's, it's a deep fake. It's a deep fake. That's all. It's it is. a deep fake. <laughs> it's not really a can of Budweiser. Let's not Those whip them out and compare them. Come on. <laughs> let's make it a. Let's make it a, a, Smith, a Smithix or something. The, the heat Samuel has Smith. made us silly. It's just. It's a, <laughs> yeah, drink. Are we going to talk beer. about any news tonight? Clouding our like judgment. We're doing news. This is all news. No, the, we're not. The we're deep fake. The Jeff, I want to hear about the puzzle uh, that was the released Turing in puzzle. honor of Alan Turing. Well, GCHQ, which is sort of the 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 British UK equivalent of NSA. Don't ask me what GCHQ stands for. HQ is probably headquarters. It stands for. Yeah, um, I don't remember what it stands for either. Uh, somebody Google it's it. It's like British yeah, it's CISA or something like that. But uh, I mean, they put out a puzzle. I think usually on on, on Turing's birthday. But apparently, Turing is making it to the fifty pound note in in the UK. Government and, Communications Headquarters. Yep. Yes. Yeah. It's uh, signal you. signals intelligence. Yeah, for UK. Yeah. It's an it's, it's the, the NSA, British yeah. equivalent of NSA. NSA. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. they in commemoration of uh, the government releasing Turing uh, on the face of the fifty pound note. They they put out a special puzzle, so it's just fun. Uh, you know, go go do it. Uh, and you know, if you're if you are at all interested in crypto. Uh, and and you know, have a little bit of a twinge of history. Uh, do it, uh, you know. And we could also talk about, and we probably should talk about the fact that Turing was uh, discriminated against mm-hmm. because of his uh, uh, his life life's what do you call it? sexual know, preference? Political. Yeah, his preferences, his mm-hmm. lifestyle, the way he was. Uh, you know, he he, he you know he. he he was basically fired and ostracized because he was gay, and and, and you know what, I think it's in this article or it was in one of the articles I was looking at today about the question, or it might have been a Twitter comment. Somebody brought up the fact that you know the the British government still actually hasn't officially formally apologized for the fact that they shit on the shat on the guy. I thought they and did I thought they did. I thought they did too. And yeah. like, they've, like well they've they've acknowledged it and I guess it's splitting hairs, but you know, they didn't you know well, they had a general apology to everyone who was tossed out of uh, security service uh, from MI6 back in the 90s, I think. They apologized to all, because they fired, it basically, uh, probably the U.S. did the same thing, but anybody who was found to be gay was considered a security threat and was immediately fired from any, and stripped of any kind of security clearance, and he got caught, and so when he got caught, they fired him, and then he was actually, well, uh, he was forced to undergo chemical castration 
It's it just as yep. oh, and and that's of course. In, I thought that the imitation my, game was was a, a really good movie and in yep. many of us know that story, but I I thought what the movie accomplished for me was bringing that to the general public. So much my in laws were like, "Oh, watch this movie, Paul, about like this the security guy like invented computers and codes." I'm like Alan Turing, the imitation game. They're like, "Yeah, how did you know?" I'm like, "That's like." The, the guy yeah you know i feel like I, that's the guy I'm this like, guy's like the genius of yeah. i mean and it's a very tragic story yeah as, it's very as well. very bad yeah. yeah i mean it's like him and babbage and those guys were an ada loveless yep but i mean turing if you go back and read turing's papers from the like 1930s and stuff they are absolutely like ahead of their time i had like off. this like crazy epiphany I, I don't even it was an epiphany i just had like a revelation when i read i read like that 1933 paper that's called like machine engines or something like mm -hmm. that i was like what this guy didn't even have a computer to work on and he was writing code for one i mean it was a, yeah. i mean the guy was a <laughs> brilliant blazing genius beyond all comprehension and it was more about computing and less about artificial intelligence, or was it, it artificial? It was more about computing and how to was, how to was, train it, computing engines to do things for you. So yeah. it wasn't really so. I mean, he gets a lot of people really focus a lot on like the AI kind of idea, like the Turing test. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I mean, I you know, I it was he was really more about trying to understand the true computer science of how machines could be manipulated and how you could manipulate them and he was doing mm. this before he actually had a machine to work on so yeah. he was he was yeah. literally computer scientist before they were computers. theorizing yeah. it yeah it was amazing i don't know what the term is but it, it, to me it's always been more the 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 speed the, you know the fact that you know like we were talking about quantum computing last week the 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 speed how many how many cycles how you know the computing power you know, if if something could be brute forced in ten million tries, you know, it, it takes a certain amount of time to do that on a, a computer with a certain amount of computing power. Um, and you know, the more computing power, the obviously the faster it it, it takes. So, uh, yeah, I don't know what the term is. Somebody could just enlighten me, but to me, the the the, the early ideas of computing was taking a manual task, something that was computational, mathematical, I guess you could say. And and just the ability to do it so much faster because it was done by a machine. I think that was the original intent. Well, Turing was so far out in the weeds, he was looking back at the weeds from the other side. I mean, he was unbelievably brilliant. If so if you ever if you ever want to go read some of those things, go dig up some of those really old papers and it, it it's a good exercise for you, really. I mean, go back in the like thirties and 40s and I know you'll say oh that sounds so dated but the reality is this guy was really where all this stuff came from he's like the the seminal work of all this stuff and and I was in grad school and I was taking a class that was called like Alice in Puzzle Land or something and it was just about building Turing machines and coding mm -hmm. Turing machines to try and and find solutions to puzzles using technology and this this was such a thought exercise and it, it literally just about killed me it was the hardest class i've ever taken in my life it was unbelievable you know it, it, mm. it's funny doug because i i happened to uh to watch a, a presentation that jack daniel gave uh at the invitation of gene spafford spaff they they have an ongoing uh i don't know if it, i think it's weekly uh, seminar series where they invite people to talk, you know, cybersecurity uh, through Sirius, which is a mm -hmm. pretty university. I'll get the link so we can put it up on the show notes later. Uh, but they had Jack Daniel on. I'm like, oh man, I haven't I haven't talked to Jack in so long. So I was like, I just wanted to hear his voice. And and uh, he was talking about sort of the pioneers of uh, on the shoulders of giants, right? Isn't that his talk? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's the talk. So he was talking about Turing, but he was also talking. And I apologize, I forget the name of the guy that turing had the ideas some engineer actually had to build the th build the machine mm -hmm. whatever it might have been babbage i, I forget no it was a babbage no, was, was dead that, by yeah. then but 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 you know you know you know he just he, it was a great talk in terms of all these people but you know the the you know we think about oh it's really so creative and amazing that we figure out how to break this stuff uh, in my, in terms of the technology, you know, the talks that we've, you know, the the sessions that we've had already tonight, and, and I'm like, yeah, but somebody had to build all this stuff yeah. in the mm -hmm. first place, and it's, I've always been of the opinion, is, and this is not meant to disrespect all the hackers and pen testers and and security researchers out there, but 
um, or Joff or Larry or Tyler, but as creative as it, as you have to be to break this stuff sometimes, <laughs> the people that had to build it in the first place and, and, and actually come up with the, the ideas to make it work and, and just create it in the first place, to me, that's where the, the real genius and creativity is. But they're all hackers at the end of the day. No, yeah, Jeff. they were. Absolutely. Yeah. These were people hacking the world. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally. Actually, that's uh, that's actually not disrespectful, uh, I don't think, Jeff, because um, I, first of all, agree with you. I, I mean, sometimes I honestly feel like a cheap hack, <laughs> quote unquote, because, you know, we are doing things that's like, oh, where's a where's a nice shortcut where we can just like beat that thing up and be done with it and move on. Um, I have every respect for the people that actually. But I, I think they you did, do have that respect that. oftentimes when you, you break into something or hack into something. You have that respect for the hacker that built that stuff. You're like, yeah, that's really, yeah. you know, you yeah. grow an appreciation for someone that, that built that thing and you're breaking that thing. Like, you're, you're both kind of hackers at the end of the day with mutual respect for each other, I think. Well, yeah, I, I think when Turing it, was, it, it, when Turing was trying to crack the crypto and, and the mm. Enigma, I think that that's, that's a, a really great example of hacking you know, by somebody who probably respected the people who designed the crypto very much and yeah. said, well, wow, I'm having a tough time with this and I'm, I'm going to beat you, but, you know, I'm going to work. I, I'm not doing it easily. Right. You're both working hard for, yep. for different goals, so to speak, but it's yeah. hacking at the end of the day. Well, and to give proper credit, and, and again, this was in Jack's talk, and I don't know, uh, and I, I apologize, I don't have the names of all the people, but, you know, the people that were breaking the Enigma machine first were, were Polish, the, mm -hmm. the Polish yes. securities, right. whatever their, their intelligence security uh, NSA equivalent service was, and, and you know, they figured out a way to break it. Uh, I mean, I, I was I was a crypto analyst at NSA. I, I I I actually did break codes and break ciphers. That was you know I, I did some uh, part of my career was over in the operations side, actually looking at the intercepted traffic of other places. Let's say, and uh, but a lot of times tell us, tell us about that, Jeff. When, will that stuff become declassified <laughs> eventually, or? You gonna take that stuff to the grave? You I, I asked that, uh, you know, honestly, because as time goes well, on, like, does stuff become the, declassified? I, I, you know, I think eventually some stuff will become declassified. What typically stays? Can we get the exclusive on classified that? forever? <laughs> is uh, you know, and, and this is, ha I mean, you know, people ask me how I, you know, how I came to work in cybersecurity so i have to talk about well it all kind of started with going to work at nsa and so the next qu logical question is how'd you end up at nsa and you know the way i ended up at nsa was i i, I submitted an application and they invited me up to take a a, a couple days worth of various aptitude mm -hmm. and skills tests and and it was almost quite literally because I grew up. I think we've talked about this before. I grew up in a house that that loved trivia, that loved puzzle solving, uh, crossword puzzles, crossword puzzle books that had all sorts of different types of puzzles and things in it, including logic problems. All that kind of stuff is stuff I like to do. And because I was I grew up on that kind of stuff, I think that's why I scored well on the test, mm. or I had the ability, whatever. But. Uh, what tends to be classified forever is how you're getting the information that you're getting, what we right. call methods and sources. So, you know, the bug that's, you know, Im embedded in a wall plaque or a painting or somebody's shoe that's, you know, in a super, you know, isolated secret meeting room, conference room in the Kremlin type of thing. You know, it, you know, it's not what the information is that you're getting. It's how did you get the information? Mm -hmm. That's what tends right. to be classified forever. And mm -hmm. a lot of the techniques have been made public. And a lot, and that's why I sometimes keep my mouth shut when we have certain talks with certain people that figured out, wow, you can like ex exfiltrate data by making the blinky lights on the box you know, do Morse code and just intercept it with a camera. Uh, I'm like, yeah, yeah, that might have been done before, and I'm not going to say one way or another. But yeah. oh, and I got one, I got one more name I for you. I, one more name you yep. should look up: Donald Michi. Does anybody know that name? Mm -mm. I do because 
pretty sure Jack mentioned him. <laughs> well, he probably did, yeah. So Donald yeah. Michi built this thing called Menace, and yep. it was a... <laughs> It's, it's unbelievable. It's literally a bunch of matchboxes, and they put marbles in there, and they use the matchboxes to learn to play knots and crosses or tic-tac-toe by mm -hmm. pulling the little sleeves open, and it, it was an engine. It was built in 1961. Mm -hmm. It was like a completely analog. It's crazy. The guy, it was like so brilliant. It's just like, Wow. And, and you have to read it in context because you, you can't read it and go, wow, I could do that with my iPhone. You have to read it in the context of 1961 and say, you know, this guy didn't have a computer. You know, a computer was the size of a, of a blimp hanger mm. and cost millions of dollars. So he was literally just, he was inventing all these intelligence and learning algorithms and he didn't have a computer. So he just built like this weird gadget to do it. It's just, it's just crazy. I, I, that stuff just blows me away. I, I always feel so so minuscule when i read that it's like mm -hmm. this awful philosophical feeling of like wow i suck <laughs> yeah, or, so, early, so i mean early hacks are really cool i read one about there was a football game in the 60s between harvard and yale and 20 mit students were able to launch a balloon that said mit and it came up in the middle of the game and then like exploded in in a puff of smoke but it wasn't <laughs> smoke it was freon but yeah. I mean, today, what I found interesting was, like, the stadium would have been evacuated, the FBI would have been involved, but, like, back then it was just, it was a cool hack. Yeah, I remember reading a Sports Illustrated article, I think it was probably in the 80s, about the the competition, I think it was MIT and Caltech, mm -hmm. uh, the things that they would do with their annual football team, you know, they, they just amazing stuff, like, they would, they would uh, you know, very complicated stuff, but it, it, you know, tricks, you know, things that you think about when you're in college, like, you know, eliminating somebody's dorm room, they would just like wall it off like the door, they would just come in and just drywall it over. So the the room didn't exist anymore. Or, or, you know, but all sorts of, you know, taking off, taking over the scoreboard, hacking the scoreboard mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's the creativity and, the, you know, what, you know that's what hacking is in in essence is what can you do right. it's not like okay this is designed to do this i'm like yeah but what else can you do with it yeah it's what like else there's the technical side but there's the like what do you do with it and i think lee and i both had the story about 11 o days that yeah. were used to infect windows ios and android users and like the tech yep. is interesting and i like talking about the tech but with this story i was like all right, it's gonna take way too long to go like look at what those eleven ODs were. Like, <laughs> but, but like, what were they trying to accomplish with eleven? And if you're gonna burn eleven ODs, 11? you probably you're. What are you trying to accomplish with that? What did you? And did why they, did you burn did they know where it was going as they burned each of the eleven? Right. Did, May, they, did, did they know? They, right. Did, where you know? They're, or they're like, oh look, we just found something else. Yeah. Sometimes the cre creativity is mind boggling. Mm. And more about what you do with it, right? I mean, because they did they, you know, you put highly sophisticated in in quotes, Lee. Did they yeah. just go buy those exploits and hit and had a, a bigger mission? I put it in quotes because it always kind of because part of this article said you know expert hackers and and mm. highly sophisticated, and I was kind of going, it's not or were always they? the case. I'm not trying to diss them for the burn it, finding and using the zero days. That's a hell of an accomplishment, but I just. You, that's a little bit much. It becomes sophisticated, I think, if you use more than three or four. <laughs> if, yeah. if you string them together, it's expert now, when you get to seven or eight. Or, or is it? I mean, is it or not? Is it, is it not sophisticated? The fact that we're talking about the fact that you burned eleven zero days, like you, were you not sophisticated? It's, it's you how did you them. get them? Though is what makes you sophisticated or not? I maybe, mean, I mean, maybe yeah, you just went you, and bought you them. You shouldn't well, need yeah. to burn them. That's wow. the thing. That's I mean, crazy. I, I, if you're doing any kind of any kind of hack, right? Honestly, to be honest, it, it I, we've said this before. Uh, you know, most most of the times, what we're doing, we're not burning anything, right? Mm, but if you're right. burning one zero day, that should be that should be enough. Yeah, honestly, <laughs> that, should be, that should be enough for anyone. Yeah. No, I agree. I I, I think that's a it's a really strange thing to see somebody burn yeah. 11, 11 zero days right like right out of the box but this is but this is one of the 800 pound gorillas that i have a problem with with pen testing is 
uh, or or all the hacks and breaches and the arguments of whether they su- were sophisticated or enough. Um, the difference between there's a target and I want to and I know that they have a particular kind of data or I have a particular vendetta against them and I want to go after them specifically. How do I do that? Versus, oh, I have this idea or I've become aware of a certain, you know, vulnerability or exploit capability. Let me go troll the Internet and just see who might be vulnerable and who I might stumble upon that I can do it. You know, the the, the, the differences in intent and targeting mm-hmm. versus just sort of targets of opportunity. And, and, and that is not a new thing, but I, I think that's a... To me, that's a, a distinction, at least one major element of distinction between whether there's sophistication or not. You know, like a nation state hack. You know, everybody's like, oh, you know, nobody can withstand a nation state hack because they have all the resources and the time and the ability and the capability and 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 they're targeting you specifically. Um, the solar winds thing. You know, we we conjectured whether that was. You know, we we discovered it and found out about it be- because of you know one or two companies and pointing fingers to, at one or two other companies, but we also conjectured early on where else is this happening? And as a proof of concept or as a, a methodology, if you will, you know where else is this taking place? And if it's a nation state, they tend to have a reason why they're doing it. They're not just out there doing it for you know for the heck of it, just to see where it, where it works. Yes, no, agree, disagree, Josh. Yeah, no. It's... Well, um, well, reasonable proposition. L- largely, I agree with what you're saying. Um, I do. Uh, it, just because it's nation state doesn't mean it's necessarily sophisticated. It does I agree. It does mean that it is going to be comprehensive generally. Uh, so I think yeah, that's like where's the sophistication? People, is it in the technical or targeted it, or yeah. or or they're doing it for a reason? They're is, not, yeah, so is they have just, a, they is have the coordination. Objective. Is the coordination sophisticated? Is the technical aspects sophisticated? Yeah, the, is the the, the, the C two channel that's, that's sophisticated? What was, like, go ahead, Job. Yeah, well, that's what I was going after. the The technical aspect is not necessarily going to be sophisticated. However, the logistics and the coordination and the targeting. And the scope and the goal are going to be very sophisticated, mm-hmm. right? Uh, you, you're still you, – I, th- I like to think of this in terms of there is a limited pool of resources of highly creative, highly technical people on the planet. And governments want to hire as many of them as they can. But it doesn't mean they get everyone, right? They get, they get a lot of great people, and they've probably got a whole lot of grinders that, you know, and n- n- no insult intended – but they're really good at process stuff, but they're not necessarily going to be those highly creative technical people. They still need those people. Mm. Don't get me wrong. They still need them in the overall scope and the targeting and the goal. But the, I, I think the thing that that it that uh, is evident by nation state attacks is that they're highly organized, right? Yeah. They're very specific. They're very scoped. They're very you know. They're not they're not random by any means, right? Which which speaks to their success more so than the technical sophistication necessarily. Um, it doesn't mean there isn't some technical sophistication. There usually is, but it's going to be a much smaller percentage of the overall target, right? It's going to be like like I said, you should only need to burn one zero day, or one or two or whatever, just to get you that next step. That's where the technical brilliance is going to be. The rest is going to be process work. I think, uh, you know, it's interesting to think about that in the context of Stuxnet, which did have some highly technical and sophisticated on the technical side. And for a while, I think, had some really great process things. But I think the only reason we're all talking about Stuxnet is because they kind of fell down in the process, which kind of leaked what was happening. But the technical stuff was there. And for a while, which it, implies it was under it the radar. wasn't sophisticated because they were like gross amateurs in the way that they... Someone along the chain ended up being not as sophisticated, right? I think they got too aggressive. Too aggressive. Right. Yep. But I mean, but you can be a great sniper. You don't have to actually manufacture a weapon. You can go buy one. I mean, so I but mean, it's a, you know, uh, <clears throat> Doug, it's a great analogy because the greatest snipers. I mean, yeah, they're a great shot. They, you know, don't necessarily have to go build a weapon. What makes a great sniper is planning. 
yeah. at being in the right place at the well, right that's, time. That's all I'm saying. To take out most is of that the enemy. These, if yeah. these are nation states, they have an objective, mm -hmm. and the objective is met by any means necessary that will, you know, that will facilitate the job. So they're not worried about counting coup or, or trying to show that they're the best hacker or anything like that. If they need to go buy a tool on the dark web, they'll go buy a tool on the dark web. And if they can find I mean, a zero day cool, Chris but Kyle they don't have is, to. It's actually a great analogy, and Chris Kyle was a great yeah. sniper. I mean, great shot, right? But if you look into that story, you read the books and you watch the movies, everyone that knew Chris always said that Chris was the most prepared for every mission, and that's what made him yeah. successful. Yeah, you know? So that's yeah. actually a really, really good, really good point, Doug. You put it very well, I think, and it's what I was trying to say. The, the, that nation-state level attack is going to be highly focused mm, yeah. strategically and tactically, it's going to be really, really focused on the goals and the targets in front right. of them. The actual technology to do it, uh, I it's also think. But I also think some of the sophistication is the smoke and mirrors, is the misdirection. Yeah, that leads us to it's all talking the, about things about what zero days they used and, and and what they went after and like maybe what infrastructure was taken down. But like what was really happening is the more sophisticated attacks, the one that used that as smoke and mirrors, that used propaganda, that used misdirection to make us think what was really happening. But what really happened was much more heinous. I, I mean, I truly believe that not Petya, for example. They were covering their tracks for something that we may never, we may never know about. I mean, and that's a basis of all that kind of thing. Is mm. like you don't get caught, don't let it be exposed. Right. So but don't someone's worry. Someone's got to take the fall for it. So yeah, but I mean, know, don't don't down worry down about stuff. that. You're yeah. going to go to DefCon and talk about this cool thing you figured out. Yeah. If somebody else figured it out and you can use it and and use it to cover up what you're doing or use it to accomplish your mission, yep. then by God, use it and don't worry about you know whether somebody thinks that you're technically sophisticated or not. Right. It's just I need to accomplish this mission and I'm going to do that with any means necessary necessary and i think that's that's true for pen testing too i mean i think pen testers don't necessarily have to be the most techno technically i, mean, I, I have a couple of examples and you know there's a metasploit module for the proxy lock on vulnerability you read the exploit it's pretty it's pretty complex yeah. but then like you know my story number four is an uncoded service path why now, not? like, Joff, I'm sure you've used these type of exploits on, on Pen. Oh, my God. It's, but yeah. it's like, no, I was like, wait, uncoded service path. Like, I got to go look. I looked it up. I'm like, wait, that's not really all that sophisticated, right? It's really not. <laughs> right. No, but it, it it isn't. But it's a really great avenue for yeah. local escalation, yeah. right? So it's a, it's a great tool to have in the toolbox. You find an unquoted service path. So basically, that means there's a service that's running that says this is the binary that's running. And it's yeah. C colon backslash program space files, blah, blah, blah. Right. And since there's right. no quotes around it, I can put something called program.exe and that runs instead of the real binary. Mm -hmm. Like it's really, that's all it is? Yeah, that, that is all it is. But you got to be careful though. The file system has to be writable. You as the regular user that has yep. access to that system. It has to be able to write to C colon to backslash. Place, yes. yep. You have to place that program.exe in mm -hmm. C colon backslash in the example you gave. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes it is the case that you can do that. Um, so, okay, it's not sophisticated, but it's a stepping stone along the way mm. to further uh, compromise that environment because local privilege escalation is a pretty big deal, right? Because yep. then you can leak, leak creds out of memory and, and go from there. All right. So, you know, uh, I, I think I'm falling down on just the, so the word sophisticated is a marketing buzzword, and we should just. You know, it's yeah, as agreed. it's almost as offensive as the way that the word hacker, hacker has been used. used. Yeah, yeah, totally. Agree. I agree. And and, okay. and I'll, I'll tell you this. You know, early in my private sector career, uh, you know, consulting and advising, and I forget. Who, I wish I remembered who it was that told me this. But you know, one of the analogies we used to use early on in terms of trying to explain to companies why they needed to worry about security and you know they're plugging into the internet they're connecting to the internet and the internet is now a backbone to their to their corporate network type of thing uh one of the analogies we used to use was you know thinking of a neighborhood and you know a a, a burglar walking up your street and are they going to try to break into your house your house being your company and just you know another company on the internet yada 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 and you know all sorts of analogies uh, about uh, you know locking your front door, locking your back door, locking all the windows, putting in cameras in place, monitor you know monitoring first floor, second floor, 
and so on. And somebody, you know, one time mentioned, you know, that's all well and good. You can have all the best technology in, in covering all the entrances. But he says, but look at the house. Most houses these days are built with plywood and vinyl siding. Mm-hmm. You know, what's to stop somebody from taking a, a, a circular saw or a, a saw saw and just cutting through the wall? I'm like, yeah, that's a really good point. Mm-hmm. Now, that's sophisticated in that it, it's – you know, you're looking at the problem. I want to get into this building, and you're you're thinking outside of the box and not accepting the the preconceived notion that the only way you can get in is windows and doors. That's sophisticated right, right. in this, and, and, but and that's you know that's the essence of hacking. Is like, well, what's another way to do it? But the answer is often pretty like, duh, that's pretty easy. That's pretty simple. And I think that's where we even struck. need to be in the house to get gasoline would, I, in, gasoline in the basement to light it on fire. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah but, I so, wouldn't so call it even sophisticated. I just call it effective. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's like What's okay, it, it's not sophisticated. It's not elegant. I just cut a hole in the wall and climbed in. Okay, but it worked. So mm-hmm. who cares? It worked. Well, that's hey, the so, objective. Point, I don't think uh, it's, uh, point counterpoint though. Um, Jane, but, you uh, ignorant slut. I, I would I would say. Uh, that sophisticated uh, is in the eye of the beholder, and and I think um, I, I can certainly speak to this as 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 a uh, pen tester, security researcher. That the more I have learned, and the more that I have uh, developed in my skills, the quieter I have become. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. I I would posit this that. If that's my sort of personal reaction as I am looking at things and acquiring sort of knowledge and skills, um, the the amount of things that are actually out there in the public is like a tiny little fraction of what's actually happening, right? Yep. And I know Jeff would be 100% all over this, right, because the, he, he's lived that other life. But I'm even talking about all the different private companies. We've got all this stuff – we don't publish at all. We don't. And a lot of us, you know, and and, and I think unfortunately uh, there's a tendency even more today to keep it to the chest because we are seeing, and this is kind of a segue, maybe it's a workable segue, I don't know in the stories, but we are seeing uh, the defensive side of the industry following the pen testing industry a lot closer these days, a lot closer. Yeah, I mean, to, to use the home analogy, it means like something in your home is gone and there's no evidence that anyone Ooh. was there, right? And, and I think that's where the more sophisti- air quotes, there sophisticated, you go. sophisticated and elegant are going, right, is there's leave no trace. Well, I mean, and that's, that's back to like what I, I always talk about, like subtlety. You know, so like mm-hmm. if you if you can crack a website and you can deface it or whatever, I mean that's just gross. Right. Uh, you know, it's still it may be what you tried to achieve, but then there's this subtlety thing where you write your own demons and stuff like that, and you stick them on the network, and they're very hard to find and they're very tricky, and then that's that subtlety. So it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. I mean, mm-hmm. if you you know, so if you're trying to be Joff and you're trying to be not seen, and and he's trying to be quiet, which is cool. That's a different mission than if you're just like, take this out, you know? So, I mean, you know, it's very, it's two very different things and both can be sophisticated. It's just about what the objective of the mission is. Mm. Well, another way to look at sophistication is the discovery process to come up with your solution. I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're thinking all, you know, you can't get past the cameras and the, and the electronics when in fact, all you got to do is go to old school and, take a hammer and bash out a wall <laughs> or more so if you say no not only am i going to take a hole in the wall but i'm going to not leave any traces of it so nobody knows i've been there that cover it with the a bar. poster of rita hayworth it, it's why sneakers is a yes. superior hacker movie nah. to the movie <laughs> nah. because when robert redford has to break into wherever the the bad guy's office to steal the C-Tech electric, astronomy the device they've got the no, before he they, breaks into C-Tech, got a, he breaks into the guy's office oh okay he breaks into the office mm-hmm. and they've got like a temperature sensor yeah. so yeah. they would not- notice a deviation they've got a motion detector so they train they they uh, they figure out a way to turn the, to crank up the the, the thermostat so yep. it's ninety eight point six degrees so they won't notice if a body comes in they do it gradually 
and they figure out that the motion detector will trigger if if there's you know motion of some number of inches within some amount of some amount of time so they teach robert redford to walk very slowly and of course they don't show the whole scene but you know the principle which uh you know shortly after that i, I read uh uh tom tachek is that Tachek. how you pronounce his name tachek yep Tachek's, uh, you know, how to evade intrusion detection, the early yeah, yeah, days yeah. of detection. It was all about, you know, whatever you have in place, it's 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 got some sort of threshold, and all you have to do is fly below the radar, fly below the threshold, and, and you're fine. It, it, and and that was the essence of his paper: is if it if it's looking for one that this thing and it's doing it a certain permutation or or, or you know whatever the cycle is, do it less. But did they hack good. the Gibson? That's you know that's oh, the they, totally, they, totally, <laughs> they they totally hacked the Gibson. Hey, look, I just I, uh, Jeff just reminded me of, of a really a fantastic story. Uh, so very briefly, without mentioning any names, one of my favorite customers, uh, who 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 I usually see um, most years, which which is a great joy. Um, one of his one of the favorite solutions that uh, that that they put in place uh, was exactly that, Jeff. They uh, they had uh, key locations, uh, mm -hmm. data center being one of them, and uh, they just stuck cameras in there. And if anything moved in that room. Uh, they had a custom. It was a custom solution. They wrote. If anything moved in that room, the uh, the screens of all of their very small IT support staff. They had a pretty small, compact group. Um, that picture popped up on everybody's phone, right? <laughs> and it was a perfect right. solution because, yeah. you know, the the minute you had a physical intrusion of somebody like me, which which I did do that, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, move move into the room, it's like boom, I got you on camera looking. Right at you know, right at the uh, the 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 uh, motion sensor camera that was that was right at the door. Please tell me you were yeah. in costume, like uh, you were dressed <laughs> up like Spider Man or something. I, I was totally <laughs> dressed up like Spider Man. The, the other the other favorite thing I will will say that that, that this customer did uh, was they had a uh, big sign over a fake door, which was data center room, mm. and then the real data center had absolutely you know, it was a nondescript you know closet direction thing. Yeah. Yeah, nice. it was great. Misdirection. Well, I, yeah, I very, suggested that very once. I was like, why don't you put would say. data center on this closet on the bathroom? Yeah, or just on this like storage closet where they had brooms and stuff. And I was like, why don't you take this data center plaque and put it on that door? And if somebody spends all their time trying to break into this closet, it'll be like, wow. I was, I was watching one of those YouTube shows, Dude Perfect. And they played the practical joke where like they had the front entrance to a, a an office or whatever. And it was like some dude sitting on a toilet. <laughs> <laughs> so like people would like walk up to like deliver a package and then open up. Like, oh my god, I'm so sorry. It wouldn't even need to be a real person. You could just put like a mannequin sitting, yeah. there, you know, with a newspaper sitting on the toilet. <laughs> the like, oh my god, no, I'm not going. But really, maybe that the was recording the recording. This is occupied. Was the, maybe that was the entrance to the data center. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh my god, this is so cliche though. One of my one of my early. Uh, uh, physical intrusion exercises. I walked into the bathroom. Speaking of bathrooms, there's a door on the side of the bathroom. I turned it. And you couldn't have written this. I turned to the door. I opened the door, and it's a fucking wiring closet. Right? Yeah, <laughs> I've heard that. I've heard that from multiple people that wiring closets I, end up in the bathroom. Sometimes I've seen that. Yeah, I've, I've, I've seen that. I've seen a wiring yeah. closet. I've seen a switch in a bathroom yeah. that was like sitting up, like uh, you know, on the like upper corner of the room, and you're like, oh, there's a switch right there. I think there. that's a real thing. Unlike the fables about servers being built into the wall and forgotten about I think yeah that's a fable. this is like people put stuff where they can put stuff in a bathroom was like oh, well there's you know space on the wall nobody's using we'll stick a cabinet but, there but i think you know in another in segue too is you know attackers just writing malware in esoteric programming languages like have you ever heard of the nim programming language <laughs> honestly i had not <laughs> right no. i had not either um but the sans internet storm center uh didier stevens now, thanks to him, there's a Python script that we can extract strings from the NIM uh, programming language. And ma uh, malware authors are writing in that language because it's so, like, obscure. Esoteric. Esoteric. Yeah, like, nobody's looking for it. But it's for uh, it. an imperative, general-purpose, multi-paradigm, statically typed, systems-compiled programming language designed by Andreas Rumpf. <laughs> it is uh, designed to be efficient, expressive, and elegant supporting metaprogramming, functional message passing, procedural, and object-oriented programming styles. Whoa. 
That's beautiful. So, Look, sounds that's beautiful. beautiful. Like yeah. the, the Wikipedia article, I was like, I, I, like, I kind of want to program. I need to go like, home tonight so and go, okay, all right. That sounds awesome. A- a- actually, uh, shameless plug for my class right there. That's exactly the reason <laughs> that does, I cover yeah. implant development in yes. multiple programming languages. Absolutely. It's exactly the reason. It generates, everyone, NIM, I mean, everyone so you looks have for a, power you have a segment on NIM? For, you know, it generates dependency-free executables that are not dependent on a virtual machine. So yeah. it's a standalone. Mm. Yeah. And so so one of the one of the problems of C C sharp, of course, is yep. that you are dependent on the on the on the uh, uh, on the uh, uh, language runtime side of mm-hmm. it, right? Um, and that also hooks you into AMC, and there's all kinds of things there on the Windows platform that that potentially can catch you, right? Um, so does that you know, does that mean race conditions are still a thing, Joe? Those yeah, are always a thing. You want some more Budweiser? Sure. Why not? <laughs> oh, Hello. <laughs> I don't know how many times that's ever been said. <laughs> Actually, Jeff, interestingly, uh, I've detected that uh, Windows Defender in particular, which is becoming a very good defensive uh, platform, mm-hmm. um, does look at heuristics uh, of between when a process starts and when it executes a network connection activity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that mm-hmm. timing there uh, can actually be an IOC yep. um, yeah. for, for Defender. Um, and so in some of my w- malware, uh, for fun giggles and grins, I've got a prime number generator just to slow down the, uh, the network connectivity, uh, <laughs> the time between process start and network connectivity. So, hmm. um, that's nice. That's awesome. Yeah. This looks cool. I mean, it looks like it says it's based on C plus plus. So, or inspired by C plus plus. So it looks like a, a very interesting thing to experiment with. If but you're, C++ you know, it, but it goes back inspired to, me to not be a computer programmer. Just oh, saying. W- I mean, once you become proficient in one language, <laughs> yeah. picking up another one is not. I mean, the first one's syntax. the hardest. Basically. First one's the hardest, yeah. and then after that, it's, it's like, okay, syntax. how do I do this thing that I need to do? do. Yeah, you stack over. It's all like, indirect pointers. Well, you know, yeah, and it's like, but is this cooler mm-hmm. in this language than this other language? And so, you know, there's languages that are more difficult to do certain things, and other la- like, like if you're doing simulations, one of the things I found when I was doing simulations was like, wow, look at Lisp. Lisp mm. is built for simulations. I mean, it's like, wow, this is so cool. And I, again, I was in grad school, and they were they were expecting people to write these uh, simulation problems in uh, Fortran. Mm-hmm. I don't know why oh. everybody did that. And I was like, I'm going to write this in Lisp. And I actually asked the guy who was teaching the class, like, would it be okay if I used a different language than Fortran? Even though I love Fortran, I'd written tons of Fortran. And he was like, you can write it in any language you like. And I was like, I'm going to write this in Lisp. And I wrote it in Lisp, and it was like nine lines of code, and other people had these giant... giant you know algorithm and he was like wow this is a pretty cool idea and i was like yeah because it's like lisp has all these things built into it i mean like you don't need to code them the right tool for the right job yeah i want to evade someone to write in nim yeah it's a similar you you know though though uh ultimately transitioning between programming people people need to people get hung up in all these religious wars about about languages and stuff bullshit you need to get the fuck over that, right? The only thing about programming language differences, honestly, it's a different way to interface with the same damn machine. It is. Yep. All right? At the end of the and, day. And if you understand the operating system architecture, you understand the goals you're after, it doesn't fucking matter what programming language you're using. That's right. Don't tell so, me English so Jeff, is better than Australian. So, do you have Australian. a preference over Fortran or Fortran 76? Yeah, Fortran, Fortran can go suck it. <laughs> <laughs> After having said all that, or I will say after spending an enormous amount of time in Python, I do I do respect the way that you can do things in Python. I was actually really yeah. impressed with Python the rocks. way the way it handled things versus other languages. It's no like, Fortran, oh. but it's okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> Fortran aside, right? yeah. I mean, we'll just leave Fortran I, out of this. Like Jeff, Jeff, just for you, I'm gonna write a shellcode injection program in Fortran. Sweet. I think oh, you should. We should do a tech. We segment. want to see that. that. Would be yeah, awesome. you should do a tech yeah, segment on that. I want to see if it. If only we could find a compiler. Go oh, <laughs> oh, I'm sure you could find a compiler. There's mm. probably a, there's probably a compiler on my on my plate. You know, my app store on my phone. Let me look. <laughs> okay, wait. if Jeff starts it's coding it's Fortran on his phone, I want to I want to see that tech segment too. Yeah, me too. You know, I learned about databases and ISAM files in Fortran. Yeah. You remember ISAM files? Yep. I That's where I learned about bug. ISAM files was Fortran database stuff. Fortran was pretty much the first programming language I learned, well, you know, in a professional setting, let's say. Hmm. And uh, it was uh, it was punch tape, not punch cards. Yep. 
Uh, yeah, I use punch, punch tape. tape. Yeah, was me Fortran too. like its own thing, or is there another language that was close? No, it to was it. its own. It was. Its it was kind of. Well, it was, it was one of the thing. original Codasil languages. So there were three Codasil languages. Mm-hmm. There, there was uh, COBOL, which was for business yep. people. There was Fortran, yep. which was for scientific. So yep. it was the original, you know, like language. Mm. And Fortran okay, so good for. I, I believe in my quick two or three lines of googling. It is possible to do what I just stated. So. I think you should definitely do that, Jeff. <laughs> All right, Jeff. Jeff I'm that was yeah. Jeff. Yeah. That was a C2 Jeff channel it. written in Fortran. Yep. Challenge is out there. Challenge is there. Boom. Look at that. I'm taking a glove and smacking you in the face. <laughs> <laughs> I, I challenge mean, it, you. It's kind of a segue into my story number 10, the deadly sins of secure coding. And the, the first is gluttony. We've implemented our own fla- framework, and it's really hard to attack. Mm-hmm. That's often where we get into trouble, which is interesting because we're talking about in the light of C2, like implementing our own framework in an esoteric or not expected language is an advantage. However, when you're developing software <laughs> that in, in production, uh, implementing your own and framework. obscurity is never an advantage. It's just it a, it's a it's a false, they talk about obscurity. Yeah, yeah it's a yeah. false sense of security at best. Yeah. So when people say things like, "Well, I'm going to do this in NIM because it's not as common as as whatever," right? I think that's that obscurity. It false evades sense. detection. But if you flip that on the actual implementation of a, a product, uh, whether it's you know specific to hardware or not, it, it that model falls down when it's on the other the other side because you yeah. want to adopt a. A common framework that's been tested. I think Jeff, you know, kind of back to you put your encryption algorithm out there for everyone to evaluate. It's the same. I, I think it was kind of the gist of the article. Like, don't be obscure. Don't try and implement your own thing. Take some of these more standard mm-hmm. libraries in order to, yep. to to accomplish your I goals. Agree. That was kind there, of the, there, the gist. There's a pretty consistent track record on. Uh, proprietary, obfuscated, you know, we're, we're not going to tell you because it's a secret. That's not security. Mm. Um, and, and I came from a, a, a discipline where you knew everything about whatever it was you were trying to either attack or protect or uh, evaluate how attack worthy it was. You assumed worst case scenario and still make it safe and still make it secure for, you know, Perhaps forever. That, that that's sophisticated. Yep. Um, it was a, a really interesting article about uh, posing the question, so to speak, that is this the toughest time of cybersecurity that we're in right now? I think it's an interesting time to pose the question. Um, you know, given what we've seen. Even just this year, when we look at solar winds, when we look at uh, exchange vulnerabilities, when we look at uh, three to four Google Chrome zero day exploits. Um, so they make define comparisons. T- define toughest. toughest. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, the, the first yeah. comparison they make is the, to the physical world. You know, in the physical world, we can keep distance, set borders, and physical security controls, but in cyberspace, those concepts no, like distance, can't. borders, and proximity operate differently, which has a profound security implication. They also say um, one thing in common between Sunburst and recent zero-day attacks on exchange is that they uh, are both found to have been state-sponsored, which we kind of touched on as well. They also talk about alert fatigue and the skills shortage as being a handicap uh, to defenders today. Is this the time where it's one of the toughest times? I, I think yeah, it's a, I, Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. No. Yes. No. No. Let's debate it. Oh, I love. I'm going no. I tell you why. I'm I'm an optimist right now. I we have more computing power. We have more data analytical ability. We have more automation to actually respond and do so. And we have more awareness. I'm an optimist here. It is absolutely not the toughest time. And my argument would be the biggest impediment we had in the past was actually awareness and buy-in, and we no longer really have that. I think it's actually a fantastic, flourishing, amazing time. But if we, have more, if we have more technology, don't we have more attack surface? I'll just play devil's advocate. Well, of yes. course we do, but we have also more technology to actually apply to the problem. 
uh, mm-hmm. would be my argument to your devil devil's advocacy. And in fact, and most technology arguably, that's new and gets applied introduces new problems, vulnerabilities, and threats and risks, and all those arguably, buzzwords that we like to throw I, out there. Arguably, security problems have migrated up the stack, and so we used to struggle with mm-hmm. massive problems at like layer two, layer three. You know, in the operating system. We're not struggling with those problems so much, right? The the the, the problems exist up in the application layer. You mean those of the stack remote code execution so. vulnerabilities that yeah, we see in Exchange? There's still other layers. <laughs> Damn you, Paul! If if I can if I can disagree with if I if I can agree and disagree with Joff, I mean, yeah, the capability is that much greater, but there's also, I mean, I, I've been on numerous conversations recently on various Zoom venue virtual meetups where, you know, we're talking about the sobering reality of, you know, water treatment facilities that are public, uh, you know, municipal governments that just, they don't have the budget, they don't have the ability to do all the rudimentary fundamental things that it's easy for us uh, experts to pontificate and say, well, you just need to do this, you just need to do that. And it's like, but that takes time and effort and money. Um, You know, the exchange server, the, you know, the, the discovery of vulnerabilities that have been there for 20, 30 years and things that we uh, hold sacrosanct. You mentioned the, the born again shell earlier, Joff. And how many years ago was it that there was a significant vulnerability discovered in the bash shell? Um, I think what it boils down to, this is my opinion is it's, it's, it's bringing to a head, you know, I asked the question, uh, you know, define security. And I think it falls down to two different definitions. There's the idea of we need to make everything impermeable to attack. That's we need to make things secure. And that's sort of one camp. And a lot of marketing programs for a lot of vendors hang out over there. But then there's this other camp that says, well, no, given the fact that vulnerabilities are pretty much a constant in here to say the threats are evolving and changing, however you define threats, security is really really the ability to monitor and detect and respond. And it's something that's active, not passive whether it's automated or manual, it takes people that are sort of, you know, manning the wall, you know, standing their post and being on the lookout for things and hopefully have increasingly better capabilities of detection because of automation and technology to find out something's wrong, something's different, something abnormal is happening. That's where I think the technology is helping us. But the reality is, I don't think we're ever getting to the point where everything is secure and impermeable to attack because as we said said earlier it's it's or we alluded to it, it's it's a it's it's easy in the grand scheme of things to break things it's pretty hard to build things that are able to withstand attacks and and Think of all the permutations and so every- loopholes of ways that can somebody can compromise and exploit it so everything you're saying, Jeff, is why I said define tougher, right? Yep. Because yeah. we we are winning the awareness war because, you know, before we used to – I mean, I remember even on this show as little as, you know, three or four years ago, we were saying, oh, my God, why don't people understand? Now there's this massive awareness that's out there, right? We have more of a volume. It's problem. massive, but it's incremental. There's there's still large segments of the population that aren't there. I, I yeah, think. but but even if the lights are misguided, the lights are on more so than right. they've ever been before. Okay, but, uh, but you said before, John, that we only a see a, but we only see a small part of our own vulnerabilities and attacker techniques. That a lot of it has gone underground. Because of that, maybe heightened awareness and kind of turning yeah. the lights on. Yeah. So, so the question's too simplistic. You know, is what what we're all mm. coming around to, yeah. right? What does tougher mean? Right? So, what's it's, the sophisticated it's, question, John? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> this is a very sophisticated show where we talk about sophisticated and, and, topics and, and we drink Budweiser. When Budweiser's. I say sophisticated, yeah. so we're in elegant. <laughs> Budweiser's got to be in there somewhere. <laughs> For sophistication. Oh man, I wish we were in the same room because we could hash this out. (laughs) (laughs) With more Budweiser. More Budweiser. A case of Budweiser, tall boys. 
But I, I, you know, I deliberately lobbed a hand grenade in with that question. I mean, that, I that was a freaking hand hand grenade. Because so. I do, I do get very concerned about the ever increasing attack surface. I, I do, and I, 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 Jeff, I do agree. Like we have made some huge strides in awareness in improving our defenses, but I worry about how much we've actually kept up with the growing attack surface. In all the esoteric things that we can do. But that's I mean, how we, paradigm shifts work. They're just mm -hmm. a constant trade-off. So I, I wouldn't call it a toughest time. It's just a paradigm shift to another state. So, yeah. you know, we start here and in 1995 and there's like nobody has any concept of security and, and so forth. And then it's like, oh, my God, we're being hacked. And, and you just kind of keep doing that. And, yeah, there's a lot of new players have entered the market in the last, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the last five years even. And suddenly it's like, well, we're dealing with a nation state here. That's pretty serious. But, okay, we'll, we'll ramp up. And so it's just this kind of paradigm shift to different Ooh. higher states in this, yeah, in this but space. Yeah, so you know, associated Doug. with that, right? We're all saying that the operational agility is like on steroids now, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you, you look at application virtualization or this containerization, right? You can spin down shit and make it disappear in a heartbeat now. You couldn't, you didn't used to be able to do that, right? So it, you, you're yeah, but what, what's the true adoption that, of people that are Making it doing disappear that. doesn't mean it's secure, though, Joe. No, I, I know that, but your ability to respond expeditiously to a threat is enormous now if you're architected in the modern world with modern technologies. I'm not saying that everybody is, but your ability to respond in that space is massive. Yeah, yeah but, but go back to exist. industrial control systems and people with on-premise exchange, there's still a pretty large percentage. And that's a new coming threat surface, but then, you know, you got to yeah. ramp up against that, and it just is always Local government on. water treatment facilities are probably not in the cloud. Yeah, but they're gonna yeah, be, yeah, that's yeah. A, and that's so, an ongoing. So, so there, problem. there are those predicting that they that they will that's inevitable they will that be. they will give be. them another year or two. Uh, yeah, but yeah, that means they, you're gonna have to pay more for your water. Yeah, it that's, does. That's, it's just a shifting paradigm. But you know, that's a great point, Jeff. That you know, I think yeah. we talk about this lift and shift to the cloud like it's just you know magic, and you snap your fingers. It, it it's not. There's a cost, absolutely associated with that, and that cost may very well get passed down to. Well, there's a there's the a users. there's there's at least two things. There there is the cost, and but there's also the presum. It, 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 it's a shifting of uh, responsibility. You know, I, I, we can't do this, or we're going to put it over here for a company organization capability that focuses on it, and so obviously they're going to be more secure. Mm -hmm. And and that's uh, a lie, unless you are intentional about what you're signing up for, and you more than likely have to pay for the additional things that that uh, provide you the security that is required and and I'm generalizing to some degree and and um, to uh, various large cloud providers credit uh, you know five six seven years ago when I first started looking at I'm not picking on them I'm using them as an example AWS uh, you know I had PCI customers like oh we'll just put things out in the cloud and all all of it will be taken care of for us I'm like no they're providing you know, it's it's a glorified hosting provider. They're going to provide lights and power. They're not implying any security. Uh, fast forward to th these days, you know, AWS, Google Cloud, Azure, they put out very detailed uh, uh, responsibilities matrix that go through a list, a long list, which is the PCI data security standard of security requirements and what they say they're doing for you, what they won't do for you, what they could do for you for a small fee, what you're still responsible for. So they've they've actually done a really good job of addressing. Don't think that you're throwing all your security you know, issues and challenges away by outsourcing to the cloud. You're still on the hook for stuff, or we can do stuff for you, but you know, but here's the list. Yeah, so, so the take-home lesson I think that we're all circling around is your ability to respond and secure your environment, sort of that combination, is pretty much inversely proportional to the legacy technology that you have under your thumb. I mean, that's really what we're saying, and we know that's true uh, in, in information security because every time that I hack an environment, it's usually some legacy issue, the keyword being legacy, that is mm -hmm. the weak link in that environment. It's I, the I mean, Achilles it, it's heel. It's very common. Yep. 
<laughs> which which translates to Joff uh, being secure, uh, evolving your security costs money. It's costing budget. I don't think we've ever, as a as an industry, properly, realistically uh, shared with entities, organizations what the true cost of doing security is. You want all this great technology, you have all these increased capabilities, it always comes at a cost. I mean, my goal as a consultant advisor has always been like, look, this is what you're getting into, and this is what you think you're getting, this is what you're not getting. If you want this level of security, it's going to cost you this. It's going to, and give them options, give them choices. But security costs money, and and that's, that's, Maybe the impetus of this article is more the realization, you know, to to, to cite Wendy Nather's uh, cybersecurity poverty line concept, that the the perceived amount of money it takes to be as secure as we think everybody needs to be, just to sort of as a baseline, is beyond the ability of a lot of companies ability mm. to, to fund it and pay we've for all accumulated it. And that's so much, a problem we've all accumulated so much technical debt that we can't we can't get into yep. the black we're, yeah we're yeah, stuck yeah, in it so, we're stuck so in the, red. the other the other, other corollary <clears throat> to what i was saying is complexity uh is uh absolutely a weakness right so uh, as a consulting responsibility um for those that are not uh you know very um high requirements or high needs in their environment, they should lessen their complexity. Mm. Right? Go to simple. And because simple is frankly going to land them in a much better space from a security perspective. Yeah, you wonder how much that complexity that we build in actually helps us achieve business objectives. I, I, I get in those conversations sometimes here at Security Weekly. I'm like, like if that image isn't like perfect like does that really impact the business and how much <laughs> technical debt are we going to incur and in, in time and resources to to overcome that i think we we struggle with that in in security as well like how much right. does that really en en like enter into your new technology decisions with your eyes wide open right mm -hmm. enter into them comprehensively understand the operational requirements but understand the the new security uh requirements that you're taking on Understand the responsibilities, uh, you know, down the line from a, from a, a a fully comprehensive perspective uh, when you're going there. Yeah, what we think we need, and what AKA we actually need. Read the small print. Yeah, because yeah. what we think yeah. we need, what we actually need, often are two different things. Like we need to be cloud native and serverless and have serverless functions. Like really, do you, do you need all that yeah. necessary complexity to achieve your business goals? Can you build something that is both resilient and doesn't incur as much technical debt? And still no, no, achieve no. your it business It needs to goals. be acronym compliant. I like that don't acronym compliant. Get over that. Speaking of debt, I, I'm looking at the clock, and I have a certain matrimonial debt, and I, I submit to yeah. our co-host that we should probably wrap this up. I agree. Yeah, that I was agree. my last. That was my last one. I wanted to bring up. It was All a doozy. Right. I loved it. So we're gonna Budweiser we're gonna night. finish our Budweiser. I've got we're gonna wrap up the show. <laughs> image of a Budweiser out of my head. <laughs> hey, take, take us, us out. out. Thanks everyone for listening and watching. Well, it's been a Budweiser swampy kind of night. So, cheers. Cheers.